This is the AFA uh, Educate America Conference, and before we kick everything off, we have a little test for you. So please reach into your green folders and look for this. Try to leave the lights out under this portion. If you don't have this in your folder, please raise your hand.
wanted to demonstrate its effects and show how the AFA can help. So he took a common hobby and transformed it into a way of experiencing the disease. First, we learned the facts about patients' lives by interviewing their relatives. My grandmother is Catherine. She had forgotten to feed the dog. She found a doll, named it. My dad's name is Richard. My name is Dad. Completely um, burned the fried chicken. Then, we had Will Shorts create puzzles based on each patient's life and the answers they can no longer find. We worked with the biggest newspapers in the United States to have the puzzles covertly published, making enthusiasts struggle to find the simplest answers. In addition to the newspapers, a range of media drove people online where they could learn more about how the AFA can provide support. We showed the effects of Alzheimer's through a crossword puzzle that not a single person can solve. We reached over 5 million newspaper readers, a total of 50 million added other media. AFA saw a 159% increase in web traffic and another 62% in calls. And with unsolvable crossword puzzles, we helped many find the answers they needed.
Uh, we're going to talk about health disparity towards Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. Um, I know many of you in this audience are caregivers, um, and we're going to talk about um, caregiver burden and resources to address that. And um, as a person who's committed my career toward um, uh, diagnosis and treatment that we don't have today, we need to be able to prevent this disease in the future. I'd like to share with you some of the progress going on in the field. So those are objectives. Anybody have any other objectives for me to cover today? That's good? Okay. So um, just let's start with the basics. Um, this is a picture of the very first person who was known to be affected by Alzheimer's disease. Um, her name was Auguste, um, and she was 51 years old when she was admitted to a psychiatric hospital with memory loss. Um, she was admitted to the hospital because not only did she have memory loss, but she was very delusional. She thought that people were uh, persecuting her, uh, stealing from her. She was very paranoid. And over several years, her symptoms got progressively worse. When she died, she was also very young. She was 55 years of age when she died. And her doctor was uh, Alzheimer's. He took care of her during life, and when she died, uh, he looked into her brain. Uh, this was Dr. Alzheimer, and when he looked into her brain, uh, what he saw were these two things under the microscope. Uh, he saw these amyloid beta plaques, and you can see the arrows pointing right to the middle of what he saw in the microscope. It was this little gumball, a little deposit of accumulation of protein that it was occurring in the brain as well as those things called tau tangles, or neurofibrillary tangles. And those two pathologies, um, those two changes in the brain, are, have been the focus of intense research um, since he discovered this disease uh, over 100 years ago. And we still don't have a treatment for getting rid of these conditions, although we're going to talk about some of the research progress. Um, and we're going to talk about how these two pathologies that he saw help us in diagnosing the disease much easier than we could in the past. So that's what we've known about the disease for a long time. Uh, unfortunately, it's a single um, disease in the top 10 causes of death and disability for which we don't have a single treatment to slow it down. So we've got our work to do. Alzheimer's disease is a form of dementia, and it's often a first starting place for questions is what's the difference between Alzheimer's disease and dementia? And here's how uh, the medical professionals define dementia. We define it as a new condition, it's acquired condition. Um, it's when there's constant confusion, uh, when the intellectual abilities are different than they were previously. Uh, it's not temporary. All of us can have transient <coughs> changes in our memory or confusion due to being ill, uh, due to medications, things like that, but that are totally reversible. Um, so it's, that's not what dementia is. And it's severe enough to interfere with ability to function. Whether we're working, it interferes with our, our ability to have an occupation, or socially, it interferes with our ability to do the things that we normally like to do. So that's the definition of dementia. We assess um, intellectual abilities by measuring um, people with memory tests and neuropsychological tests to see which aspects of higher thinking are affected. Uh, and we also include in our definition of dementia that there have to be at least two different types of thinking affected by the disease. Uh, typically in Alzheimer's disease, memory is one of the things that's almost always affected, and it's usually affected first. Um, but other things uh, that are brain is capable of, like language, um, like learning new activities, motor skills, our visual perceptive abilities, what are called our executive functioning, which is our ability to judge and plan activities, and sometimes our personality or behaviors can change. And all those things are part of an assessment that, we, that goes into this definition of dementia. Alzheimer's disease is one of those we'll talk about in a minute. We talk a lot now about um, a prodromal stage before people develop dementia. We often recognize that now as a condition that's called mild cognitive impairment. So how do we define mild cognitive impair impairment compared to dementia? Uh, we define the first part as the same. It's an acquired condition, somebody who changed from their usual state. 
Um, again, the symptoms of memory loss and confusion are not temporary, they are persistent. And the condition is mild. I don't like the, using the term mild um, as a doctor because I know for many people, when I say you have mild cognitive impairment, it implies that I don't think it's important or I think it's trivial. Um, when in fact, I know that's not the case. We use the term mild by convention, but it means that it's, there are ways for it to get worse over time. And unlike dementia, where I said two areas of thinking have to be affected, um, we often will diagnose, do I diagnose mild cognitive impairment with only my memory loss as the only problem. There are some other types of mild cognitive impairment which don't involve memory, which might be due to executive dysfunction, for example. And the reason we focus on mild cognitive impairment is it's the very first symptomatic stage. So when people begin to develop isolated memory loss um, and it meets these other conditions, that's a trigger to really get an evaluation because at that stage is the first time a person with memory loss <laughs> can be aware and a family might be aware or a friend might be aware. And that's our greatest chance of intervening uh, in earlier in the stage of the disease and making sure that somebody affected by memory loss uh, is aware of what's going on so they can help uh, themselves deal with it. So what typically brings a person to a doctor um, in these early stages of mild cognitive impairment when there are early cognitive complaints? Some of the things we hear over and over are that somebody's forgetful. This scares the devil out of all of us, right? Who hasn't lost their keys, forgotten where they parked their car, forgot about the shopping mall. Um, all sorts of things happen to us, and that's because throughout our life, our memories are far from perfect, and that's just human nature. So really, what the forgetfulness that becomes important is when it's a change and there's more forgetfulness than we usually are, have been. Um, often a family will be aware of that because someone will repeatedly ask the same question. What are we doing today? And then they'll be told the answer. And 10 minutes later, they'll say the same thing. Misplacing objects is very common. Again, this is something that happens to all of us. Um, can't tell you how many times I put my cell phone down and forget where I put it. I drop my glasses somewhere. Um, all that happens to everybody. But it's the frequency and persistence of that when it's really changing when it becomes something um, to consider getting an evaluation. So those are all memory symptoms. Language can also be affected, and typically when our language system is affected, usually it's just difficulty finding words. Um, partly that's related to memory. You might recognize somebody in church and you forget their name. Or there might be an object that you don't use very often and you can't recall the name of it. Loss of, loss of initiative is a part of this disease process, and it's something that we don't pay enough attention to, I think, as doctors, and I don't think there's enough awareness in general about it. Loss of initiative is part of what I consider the executive function, the front part of our brain that are involved in planning and initiating activity. The medical term for that is apathy. And what happens as part of the disease is people lose the initiative to do things. And all too often I hear a caregiver say, you know, my spouse is just sitting around and we don't do anything. It's really important to recognize that the person affected by memory loss may not be able to control that. And so um, oftentimes that can be helped quite a bit by providing support and structure, getting ahead of the things and planned activities. The person will often overcome that loss of initiative and do much, much better. There's something often that we call uh, apraxia, which is a medical term for losing our ability to do complex motor tasks. It might be something like playing the piano that somebody did routinely, uh, where all of a sudden the sequence of movements becomes more difficult uh, than the task. Uh, for people in more severe stages, that might <coughs> mean difficulty dressing, uh, or you know, putting on <coughs> one leg at a time, buttons and buttons of a shirt, things like that can become affected as part of the dementia syndrome. And disorientation to time and place is actually a very early uh, problem that happens for many people. They can't remember, uh, for example, what year it is. You know, we don't ask people routinely, and uh, what we often realize is that what's preserved in the early stages, um, not on this list, and what's pre preserved is personality <coughs> and inability to interact socially. So all too often, people for years have been perfectly, been appearing perfectly normal uh, because they're able to have a, you know, say, hi, how are you doing? How's the weather? Um, how's your family? You know, they can answer. 
that's a very simple question, but it's when they pull back the covers and delve a little deeper, that's when the other types of symptoms often will become apparent. The reason I'm here and uh, the uh, AFA is here is because this disease is becoming more and more common. Um, Alzheimer's and related forms of dementia are, are really becoming a crisis globally. Um, you can see here that the worldwide costs are uh, nearing a trillion dollars a year. In this country alone, in the decades ahead, it's expected to exceed a trillion dollars. Um, it's something that we can't afford. And the financial costs are dwarfed by the personal and family <coughs> tragedy of somebody affected by this di uh, disease. Um, one out of every three seconds, there's a new diagnosis now. We've got 10,000 baby boomers turning 65 years of age uh, a day, um, and estimates are that about one out of every 10 of those have Alzheimer's disease. So I mentioned to you that dementia is a general term uh, when one loses um, their intellectual abilities and memory gradually, and it's an acquired persistent condition. Um, and there are many different causes, and you can see that on this pie chart that Alzheimer's disease is the biggest slice of this pie. So Alzheimer's disease is the specific form of dementia for about two-thirds of all people affected by dementia. And you can see there are a lot of other things. And this is just a partial list. Some of the things like Parkinson's disease, frontotemporal dementia, vascular dementia, <laughs> something related to when multiple strokes occur in the brain, causing somebody to have these same symptoms. And there are others. And so we like to now think about a precise diagnosis and because <coughs> as we go forward, we're gonna have to target exactly what's going on in the brain to make sure we're getting the treatment right. Again, it's a, it's a national crisis which has uh, even a higher burden here in the southeastern United States. Uh, as shown on the map there, uh, Georgia, South Carolina are uh, right in the heart of uh, one of the highest rates of Alzheimer's disease projected ahead in the country. <coughs> We can see that there's a predicted 35% increase by 2025 in Alzheimer's disease here in the state. So we've got a lot of work to do locally as well as globally. So let's shift gears now. Now that we all have a common understanding of what dementia and Alzheimer's disease is, let's talk about some of the risk factors for these conditions. And uh, particularly, let's focus on those that we can do something about. Um, so th these, this is a list of risk factors. Um, as you can see, the first four are mostly out of our control. Aging is by far <coughs> the number one risk factor. The older we get, the greater the chance of getting Alzheimer's disease. And that pretty much seems to cap out by the time people are 85 years of age, nearly um, one out of every two people, uh, maybe one out of every three people in some communities will be affected by Alzheimer's disease. Okay? That's at the age of 85. Uh, the good news, if you don't have Alzheimer's disease by the time you're about 95, your chances start going down. <laughs> so you got a goal. You got a goal. <laughs> also, one of our controls of our are our genes. Um, as my colleague Dr. Jinwa, who some of you know, likes to say, you have to choose your parents very wisely. <laughs> So it turns out Alzheimer's disease is, is mostly inherited, um, and we can't do anything about that. We think that anywhere from about 60 to 80 percent of the cause of Alzheimer's disease is due to um, those genes that we inherit. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And so while we can't change our parents, um, we might be able to modify the impact of the genes that we inherit that we pose risk. Gender is also a risk. For you unfortunate women out there, sorry girls, um, women are, are more affected by this disease, not only as the people affected, uh, but they also bear the brunt of the disease as caregivers, as we'll talk about. Uh, head injury um, is one of those areas that's sometimes preventable. Um, it's certainly not preventable for a soldier or somebody involved in a car accident, um, but it's certainly avoidable for a, uh, a high school football player. A uh, hockey player, um, uh, a bicyclist who doesn't wear a helmet, uh, things like that. And so we're learning more and more that head injury, perhaps even mild head injury, is an important risk factor um, for dementias. 
vascular disease now gets into an area where we have an enormous opportunity to, to, for us to do something about. And when I say do something about, I think it's really important that we do this throughout our adulthood, from young adulthood into middle ages, um, and it's not too late as we get more senior. Um, simply controlling blood pressure is now recognized to be a really important thing. Um, vascular, <laughs> vascular disease is also affected by diabetes. Um, controlling our blood sugars can be very important for reducing vascular disease. Uh, and lifestyle, you see there, the <coughs> gentleman sitting in his uh, easy chair watching now the Falcon Blues. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't see Freddie Falcon here. He might be able to lobby still in front. So lifestyle, we're learning also is very important. So exercise is something that clearly helps our heart, and we're learning more and more about how it might help our brain. Um, so again, some of these risk factors are controllable, and I mentioned to you that this disease is mostly inherited, and the way that I think about how these risk factors impact the disease is I, I think about the normal progression of Alzheimer's disease, which is shown here in this cartoon. Um, uh, cognition, our thinking ability, is typically fairly well preserved throughout aging until people begin to have this first stage of mild cognitive impairment, and then over about a six to 10 year period, typically the symptoms progress and get gradually worse you know, through the stages of mild, moderate, and severe dementia. But um, what, the way I think about that is that those individuals affected by dementia are mostly governed by their when aging begins to affect their genetic risk. Um, but that risk, when those risk factors begin to influence a person and when the symptoms of dementia begin to have their onset, may be mitigated or exacerbated by these risk and protective factors. So somebody who has had head trauma, uh, depression, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, uh, diabetes, all those risk factors um, might make the dementia begin at an earlier age than it would have otherwise. Uh, and we can mitigate those risk factors through things that um, are protective, like education. Now what you're doing today is activating your brain and that hopefully will be helping you. Uh, we're learning that diet may have an important role in protection. A Mediterranean diet we're learning is very anti-inflammatory uh, and can have <coughs> beneficial effects throughout the body. Um, for example, the heart, uh, reducing the impact of diabetes, atherosclerosis, um, and we think now brain health as well. Exercise, I mentioned. Uh, we're, there's a lot of interest in uh, the role of inflammation in the brain. Um, inflammation plays a key role in a lot of major health conditions like atherosclerosis, the impact of high blood pressure seems to be mediated by inflammation as does the effect of diabetes. And we think Alzheimer's disease also involves inflammation. And there's some evidence that anti-inflammatory drugs may actually reduce the risk. I'm not recommending that at this point, but can add to various research. Uh, we certainly know that cholesterol is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease and heart disease, and we have <coughs> medications that are very, very effective at reducing cholesterol levels, the bad form of cholesterol, and those are called statin medications. Um, and there's been, there have been studies suggesting that people who take statins have a significantly lower risk of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and then my favorite, of course, particularly for uh, breakfast, is red wine. <laughs> so protecting your brain health, really it's a sort of common sense approach to uh, maintaining overall good health. Um, if you keep your body healthy, your brain has a better chance of being healthy. And so, uh, these are the, the, the tenant circles of keeping yourself healthy, or healthy eating, regular exercising, keeping your brain active, social connections, and, and uh, we're learning also sleep is an important aspect of uh, keeping our body and brain healthy. People often wonder, so um, I have a family member, or I'm personally affected by a memory loss, what am I gonna do? How do I get a diagnosis and what's involved in that? So let's talk about that for a few minutes. <coughs> so I showed you this, um, this progression uh, of Alzheimer's disease from mild, moderate to severe stages of dementia. Uh, and I start that with how we diagnose the disease because we rely very much on the person affected by memory loss and even more so on a family or friends to come with them to, to the clinic to see their doctor 
to tell us what's going on. There's nothing more important for us uh, than to have some time to talk to a patient and family and learn uh, what the situation has been. We can make most of the diagnosis just based on a careful history and understanding of what's been going on. Uh, so that's clearly the first step. Uh, so we unfortunately, currently we wait for symptoms to begin because it's the symptoms, even in the mild cognitive impairment stage, that trigger somebody to be concerned enough to uh, uh, go see their doctor. Um, typically part of the evaluation is a brain scan. Um, if I have a history from somebody that they've had progressive memory loss, forgetfulness, that's beginning to affect their functioning, um, I know that um, I'll do memory tests and a careful neurologic exam. Uh, as good as we think we are, there are lots of things in the brain that can cause these symptoms and the only way we can see them is through doing a brain scan. So this is a picture of an MRI scan. It will help us diagnose some treatable conditions, like uh, when there, there's a fluid accumulating on the brain that is potentially treatable, uh, called hydrocephalus. Um, and in Alzheimer's disease, what we often see is a, a particular pattern of shrinkage of the brain, uh, which is what this MRI shows. What we can't diagnose yet are uh, very easily are the pathologies of the disease. And I show you this, remind you about the two pathologies that Alzheimer identified, the amyloid plaques that are shown in the upper left, and the neurofibrillary tangles that are made up of this protein called tau. So those microscopic changes, we can't see on a brain scan. Uh, we don't get those in a blood test. Uh, we don't get those from memory tests. So mostly what doctors do is rely on their judgment to guess whether the amyloid and the tau tangles are present. That's changing rapidly. There's another really important thing on this slide that I want you to take away, and that's when the amyloid and the neurofibrillary tangles are developing. You can see that's to the far left. Uh, they begin to occur at a much younger age than even the very first symptoms of memory loss. So we now think that those changes of Alzheimer's disease are present in the brain beginning about 20 years before the first symptoms. It's really staggering, 20 years. So I mentioned that nearly one out of every two people at age, at age 85 have Alzheimer's disease. That means they had Alzheimer's disease 20 years earlier and didn't know it. So that's really been important for us to realize as doctors and researchers because my chance of helping someone in the future is gonna be much better um, if I can get ahead of the game, not wait till the disease process has affected the brain for 20 years. So that's where a lot of research is headed, um, trying to improve our ability to diagnose and detect people in these pre-symptomatic stages. And then of course, we wanna couple that with more effective intervention so that in the future, obviously we wanna prevent this disease entirely. So what's going on for early detection? I told you what typically happens when people come to the um, clinic. Um, we'll do some blood tests to make sure they don't have deep drug deficiency or diabetes and things like that. Um, and we'll typically do memory tests. Um, those of you who are brave enough to get a memory screening today, I'm not sure. What is our memory screen gonna be composed of today? Five questions. So you're gonna be asked five questions, start sweating now. <laughs> Think about the answer. Um, um, and what we find is that the thing that people hate most when they come to see us is getting memory testing. It's, it's the most important thing we do to really assess if there's a problem, but boy, we all hate it. Um, and I think, I don't know whether it brings back memories of uh, taking a test in, in school um, and thinking about failing it. You know, somebody who's that concerned about their memory left their memory and taking those is, is obviously extremely challenging um, and uh, can be anxiety producing to know that they're gonna have that assessed. So I'll mention some of the things we're doing to try and mitigate that. But there's a lot of research going on, including new ways to do brain imaging. Um, I'll show you some examples uh, of uh, some new eye tests, blood tests, and uh, spinal fluid tests. And currently we actually do some of these new things in our own practice. One thing that's been available over the last few years um, are new brain imaging methods called PET scans. And so PET scans allow us to visualize the chemical changes of Alzheimer's disease. 
And there on the left panel, you see um, examples of a PET scan for amyloid, which detects the presence of amyloid plaques. And so you can see um, in that panel on the left, there are three pictures of brain. Uh, there's a person with Alzheimer's disease on the left, and the areas of red and yellow are highlighting the parts of the brain where there's a lot of amyloid plaque accumulation. Um, the person uh, on, the, on the right of that panel, um, there's very little red and yellow, and that's a, a person who doesn't have Alzheimer's disease, has normal memory and thinking, and is fortunate to not have any significant amyloid buildup in the brain. That one in the middle is um, very interesting because that person in the middle there, you can see there's a substantial amount of red and yellow um, up at the top part of the brain there. Um, and if I were to look at that, I'd say, well, that person has Alzheimer's disease. But in fact, that person has no problems with their memory or thinking. So clinically, they don't have Alzheimer's disease. So they're one of these people that we now recognize as in the preclinical stages of the disease where the, the pathology is there, but they yet don't have symptoms. So that's one of the pathological features. And there on the right, we have, there's some new research PET imaging methods to allow for the first time the visualization of the neurofibrillary tangles. Um, and that's, the, you can see two brains there. One on the left is, again, a normal person without any accumulation of the neurofibrillary tangles. And the one on the right, you can see the, the rim of the neurofibrillary tangles in yellow and red, which are the high amounts of tangles present in the cerebral cortex of the, of the person. So the FDA has approved, we can use, we can do amyloid imaging. Anybody who comes to see us in clinic, I would recommend that we not ask for it uh, since your insurance company or Medicare won't pay for it. Um, the cost in this varies from hospital to hospital, but typically now around 10 to $15,000 that we can be asked to pay for out of pocket. Um, probably not a good use of your money right now. We don't, we don't like to do that. Um, uh, so we want to develop more uh, more effective, cheap ways that are more widely available. That might change. Medicare uh, is considering whether to approve that. And we might see it approved if there is a medication uh, which becomes a very expensive medication to effectively slow the disease. If that happens, as we predict will happen in the, in the next few years, Medicare might actually require these expensive PET scans to make sure that there's a justification for the expensive medication. If you could advance for me my clicker, that it seems to be working. Thank you. Um, what we do, because of the expense of the, of the PET scans, is what we do is a other test, which is as good as the PET scans for detecting the presence of the Alzheimer's disease pathologies. And we do that through a spinal tap. Spinal tap is a very simple procedure for us. We do it in the office. It takes about 20, 30 minutes. Uh, people think it's a horrendous test. In fact, I've had one, of, one of my colleagues have had one. It, for us, it's almost like drawing blood. Uh, we numb up the back and we place a very thin needle below the spinal cord so there's no risk of injuring somebody. And we just withdraw a couple of tablespoons of the spinal fluid. And that spinal fluid bathes the whole brain. And so it allows us the only place where we can directly access the brain tissue or the washings of the brain tissue. And we can then measure uh, the pathology biochemically. So we can measure the amyloid and the neurofibrillary tangle proteins, tau and phospho tau. Um, and so it gives us a biochemical measure to determine if Alzheimer's disease is present. And it, it actually turns out this test is more sensitive than even those PET scans, even though you don't see a, a pretty picture. So we do this, but it's obviously something that um, most doctors don't feel comfortable doing. Um, and, uh, and many people are very uh, fearful of having a spinal tap, um, which I hope uh, we can correct with education and, and awareness. Um, but we realize it's not ideal. So you're gonna be asked five questions today. The people who come and see us, when we do studies, um, we do, uh, we'll have, so many of our research studies involve these PET scans, they involve an hour worth of memory testing. Uh, they involve the spinal tap. And uh, after doing all that, um, our patients tell us that the thing they fear and hate the most is the memory testing. So we started working several years ago on some other ways that might be um, much, much better and more fun to detect memory. I thought I'd just share with you an example of one test that we're doing. 
Um, what we're able to do is show people pictures. And so we show them on a computer screen uh, a picture, for example, of those chil two children sitting on a bench. And you can see that there's a little suitcase sitting next to them. And so we show people a series of these pictures, and we don't even actually tell them we're assessing their memory. We just ask them to look at it. And while they're looking at the picture, we're looking at them at which part of the pictures they're looking at. And we can measure that with a camera. And if you could advance that for me, please, um, and advance it one more time. And what we do is we show a series of pictures, and um, after about a minute or two, we'll show the same picture to people, um, but we'll manipulate it. So you can see when they see the picture the second time, the suitcase is missing. If you notice that the suitcase is missing, that tells us right away that you remember uh, seeing this picture before. So it gives us a very easy, sensitive way to measure memory. And what those bar graphs show is that, in fact, you can distinguish between people who have normal memory, mild cognitive impairment, and Alzheimer's disease. Again, if you could advance that for me. Um, and this just compares it to a standard test. This is the MOCA uh, score. Many of you may have heard about it. President Trump made it famous when he declared he did it. He got a perfect 30 on it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I rarely have seen 30 in my life. So um, we're also, in addition to assessing memory in a fun way like that, um, we also are developing some new ways. We're working with a company called Neurovision, which made the exciting discovery a couple of years ago that these amyloid plaques that are developing in the brain may also be developing in our eye, in our retina. So what we're working on is a method to, um, uh, if, if you could advance this, to actually look in the retina, and that's what you're seeing here, what we see in the back of the eye when we look through that camera. Um, all those white spots on the back um, of the retina are what we think are the amyloid plaques, or the accumulation of the same plaque-like structures that occur in the brain. So this gives us a very easy, non-invasive way, potentially, to monitor whether somebody has Alzheimer's disease pathology. And as I think about the future, we can actually see if our treatments are having an effect if we're getting rid of these things. So it's one of the things that we're testing as well. The holy grail uh, for all of us is the equivalent of a blood test uh, for cholesterol, for example, um, where we would like to have part of the general screening when people see their doctor, <coughs> perhaps starting when they're 50 or 60 years of age. They have a very simple blood test that can be done to determine if these same changes in Alzheimer's disease are present. <coughs> and until this past year, uh, none of us thought that would be possible. Um, just earlier this year, this research article came out uh, from Japan and Australia uh, demonstrating um, what we think is a very promising method. Um, I've now seen three different approaches that do blood tests that get very promising. So one of the things that we're very aggressively working on is trying to establish whether these blood tests will be effective and reliable. So um, I, I see this whole field of research and early detection and diagnosis changing very much in the near future. Of course, I don't want to diagnose anybody unless I can do something about it. Um, even without a medication, we can do a lot, uh, as we'll talk about. Uh, but obviously, the ideal thing would be to have a medication or some other intervention which would be able to prevent the disease from progressing and hopefully reversing. So where are we uh, in that journey? Um, currently, we have several approaches once a diagnosis is made. Um, we think about medications, uh, which are several of the things listed there on the left side of the slide. There are two general classes. One general class of medications goes by the name of a cholinesterase and pindermate. Uh, there are several different brand names that you might see advertised, like Aricept and Exelon. Um, I think all these medications work very, very similarly. Uh, they have very similar benefits very similar risks and side effects. Um, they're mostly just, uh, the major difference is they're how they're administered and the marketing that we see, uh, that we believe one's better than the other. Um, we use those medications predominantly in the early and moderate stages of Alzheimer's disease. And when symptoms become uh, more severe, um, often we'll add another medicine called Menenda which works by a different chemical in the brain and which has been mostly shown to be effective at, in the more uh, severe stages of the disease. Other medications can be really helpful for uh, alleviating some of the other symptoms of the disease. 
Uh, for example, depression is almost part and parcel of it. People who often become sad use an initiative like we talked about earlier for antidepressants can help that. Um, we struggle very much uh, as do families and caregivers when people develop behavioral symptoms of the disease. Um, everybody's experience, those are the most difficult. Uh, when personalities change and people become agitated and fearful, it really makes you know quality of life horrendous for the person living with the disease and for their family and caregivers. And we don't really have any medications which have been shown to be useful for that. Again, there's some research, there's some promise, uh, but they haven't been adopted yet or approved by the uh, FDA. And often what we uh, learn is that the best way to deal with those behavioral problems is through behavioral approaches. Uh, trying to identify what are the things in the environment that are causing somebody to be afraid. Uh, is it a particular caregiver that somebody is confused about and thinks they're trying to hurt them? Uh, simple switches like that in caregiving or routines um, that might be precipitating uh, the behavioral problems are, are really important, but they're challenging. Uh, and we clearly have more work to do. Currently, I think one of the things we don't do enough of is give caregiver support. I know many of you in the audience are caregivers, um, and I think a lot of people struggle. There's a diagnosis made. We might prescribe medications and say, please come back and you know, change your lifestyle with these healthy behaviors that we talked about. Yeah, but then often caregivers feel like they're drifting alone out in the sea. How am I going to deal with this? This is a pretty overwhelming, um, uh, overwhelming future in front of me. And so, making sure that we provide education and resources to patient families is really uh, the mission of the foundation, as you heard about. Certainly, one of the key missions for us at the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center at Emory and other uh, specialists. Uh, we have the Alzheimer's Association, the Rosalind Carter Caregiving Institute. Uh, there are many groups that are very committed to this, but we recognize that. Uh, this is still a, a, an area uh, where we need to be better. Uh, but it's been shown over and over again that early diagnosis coupled with providing the support helps people deal with the disease much more effectively. It can even reduce the cost of the disease by keeping, by reducing the amount of hospitalizations, for example. And then most importantly, I think it gives people with memory loss um, the opportunity to participate in their own planning, how they want uh, the, uh, their own future to go. And I, uh, although this is a pretty tough disease, um, I remain and have never been more optimistic about uh, uh, the future uh, and the progress ahead. And uh, oftentimes people like to participate, to do something, to contribute to how we can learn more. And it's a great opportunity for people affected by memory loss and others to participate in research uh, to help us uh, on this journey to hope and improvement. So why is this important? Because even if we can delay the disease, it's a first step before preventing it. If we can delay the disease, uh, we're gonna be able to reduce the burden dramatically, and that's what this figure shows. Uh, so this is a disease where we have a 20-year period where it's silent before symptoms begin. Just think about that. If we identified the disease maybe 10 years uh, before symptoms began and could delay it five years, many people would then live their normal Life. They would, might die of their heart disease or cancer, uh, but have a fully intact mind. And, and a, we like to joke in neurology that we win if you die, <laughs> then your mind is okay. <laughs> One thing I wanted to also um, address, and this is a very important topic to us here in Atlanta, and that's the health disparity. Um, there are lots of health disparities uh, for all sorts of medical conditions, and we're learning more and more about the health disparities that exist for Alzheimer's disease. And here in Atlanta, home of civil rights, we feel a particular ob obligation and responsibility to do right for our community. Um, just the, the other week, the CDC um, put out some new data um, to what we've known, and that's that the incidence of Alzheimer's disease and dementia uh, is up to double in African Americans and, and Hispanics. That's what these figures show. You don't need to look through the details. Um, that's the simple fact. Um, and there are a lot of factors that go into why uh, there may be ethnic differences in Alzheimer's disease. As I mentioned, it's, uh, some estimates are that it's twice as common in African Americans. Um, what's um, a 
following is that African Americans are typically diagnosed at a later stage. So as we talked about the importance of early diagnosis, we need to make sure there's awareness so that all people can get diagnosed and be benefit and benefit from uh, the opportunities with early diagnosis. And when I look into the future and know that we're gonna have a treatment soon, um, it's unconscionable to think that people are not diagnosed and not uh, available to have treatment that might be helpful early. Um, and the other thing that um, I, I, is really important to point out, the research that is leading to all sorts of promise for diagnosis and for treatment, um, the worst situation we're gonna end up in is if we don't get people of all colors participating in research, we might end up with treatments and diagnoses that only apply to a certain segment of society. We've seen that in other examples of medication and medications have different have racial, different effects on different races. Um, and so for us to be effective in, uh, in making sure that we're helping everybody, we need everybody to participate in research, not just whites. So we've been focusing um, at Emory on uh, what we can do to help address the health uh, disparities that exist. Um, there's a tremendous uh, minority engagement for several here, Cornelia uh, Dorman, uh, uh, if you could stand up, Monica Parker, if you could stand up, uh, Clint, you're here, if you could stand up. We have had tremendous community support inside and out uh, to help, help deal with this. Um, this slide shows at the bottom there the late Bishop Adams, who is an incredible champion uh, for us uh, in this community. So he passes here, and his, uh, his mission lives on through all of us. Um, and we have a lot of work to do, but we've really been uh, beating the drums. We've been uh, getting tremendous engagement from African the African American community here, uh, and we've been very, um, I think, su beginning successfully. We certainly have ways to go. Um, but we're really strengthening the capacity of the African American community uh, by promoting healthy aging and through events like this and, and others. Um, where we are right now, um, this is the, we have an Alzheimer's disease research center where we keep a list of people who participate in the research center uh, and get active in studies. They come in every year to help us learn about memory and often they will get involved in different studies that we're talking about today. Uh, you can see the breakdown uh, racially in our population. Uh, we still have the majority white males and females, um, but we're making progress. Um, about 30% of the participants are African American. Um, black men out there, you laggards, we need more of you to participate. Um, it's one of the greatest challenges in our time these research. We can't get African American men to participate as readily as we need to. Uh, you don't need to look at uh, the breakdown here. Um, I don't know who did the color code on this slide for me, Cornelia. Um, <laughs> blacks are blue and whites are red. Okay. Um, the only important thing here is that we had a lot of health disparities in our own center until we started waking up and recognizing how important it was to, for us to make the extra effort to engage the African American community. And we're not. So the last several years since 2015, you can see that the number of African American participants enrolling each year meets or exceeds the uh, Caucasians, which we're, we're thrilled by that progress. We also mentioned how we know that we have a lot more work to do to help the caregivers do better. Uh, this is an important area of research. Uh, nationally, we have research summits where scientists get together and we identify where we are as a field across this country and across the world, and we establish the research priorities. For the very first time this past year, there was a research summit on caregiving research, which is fantastic. So there's a whole um, area of research where we have to learn what are the needs of caregivers and how do we address them. And that's not something that's so easy. It takes all of you to participate and it takes research groups to be engaged in that process. Again, at Emory at the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, we've been very fortunate to have uh, a really an international leader, uh, Ken Heffer, uh, and many other faculty and staff who have been working with Ken on a program called the Savvy Caregiver. If you could advance the next slide for me. Um, so some of the caregiving facts are that 85% of dementia care is provided by families. Uh, so you know, well, we have a government out there and other resources out there, the, you know, the bitter reality 
is it's we're taking care of our families and ourselves for the most part and there's usually there's one caregiver and that each one caregiver um, mostly is a woman um, and when you have one caregiver who's a woman uh, who is more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease and might be elderly you can see how precarious the whole situation is um, the stress of caregiving is enormous for many of you who know um, stress will lead to all sorts of health problems and so one has to take care of themselves as a caregiver in order to take care of uh, their loved ones and this is uh, not an uh, easy journey. This goes on for years. Twice as likely uh, as non-caregivers to become physically or emotionally ill. Not surprising. Uh, caregivers have an immune system which is compromised, so they're more uh, prone to getting infections or other medical problems. Um, what happens when you have in their caregiving role? Uh, again, it's all too well known for those who are doing it is that they don't have time to participate in their church, their community, and to see uh, friends, uh, which is so necessary to rejuvenate themselves. Uh, and people don't have the money. This is an extraordinarily expensive uh, proposition to be a caregiver. And uh, it often is taking people out of the workplace um, in order to take care of their family. So we begin to help address this. This is a, a picture here. At the head of the table is Ken, uh, who's a professor in the School of Nursing at Emory. Um, he developed a, a program which is now being used in several countries worldwide. And it's a, it's a program which he developed to train the caregivers, um, to help caregivers early in the disease learn about the disease and how to become a better, uh, a better caregiver, how to help guide a person living with Alzheimer's disease um, through their journey, um, how to address safety issues how to help keep a person affected by memory loss engaged in the community and, and uh, enjoying a, as good a quality of life as possible. And one of the things that we do when we do research is we typically do research in a very focused way, and those things that we learn are effective. What we want to do is disseminate that through publications and practices, and Ken has been very successful. As you can see, he's gotten the um, Savvy Caregiver Program now used in 15 states. Uh, across the United States and as I mentioned in several other countries. Um, but it's a first step. Uh, 15 states is only the tip of the iceberg uh, and even those states are not reaching a very uh, large number of people. It's a pretty intensive program that he developed. While it's effective, it takes one-on-one -on -one training and a one in a small group training um, and um, people are often not available. Somebody's got to come into the center uh, to participate in the training session, that isn't always so easy when they're a caregiver to get a, get away. Uh, and so Ken's working on the next step of this, which is a tele a tele savvy program, so it could hopefully be developed in a remote way uh, through the internet, for example. In the last few minutes, let me um, just more sp uh, speak a little bit more generally about what we're doing at Emory in the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. We're part of what we call the Brain Health Center at Emory trying to be more comprehensive in how we think about uh, diseases of the brain and how we can uh, learn to address them more effectively. You can advance, next slide please. This is a picture of uh, Executive Park off North Druid Hills and uh, 85 where we have a new Brain Health Center. Uh, we're expanding into a second building and hopefully a third in the next year or two. Um, and what I want to just touch on is a few of the programs that we have in place there, um, which we're very excited about, including the Emory Integrated <laughs> Memory Care Program. I uh, mentioned uh, a new program called the Mild Cognitive Impairment Empowerment Program. Um, I'm very proud of the Georgia Memory Net, which I'll mention, the Emory Healthy Aging and Healthy Brain Study, and the expansion of our clinical trials uh, capacity. The Emory Integrated Memory Care Clinic. While we were sitting here this morning, I was checking my email. This is a new program we stood up just a couple of years ago, and the email I received today gave us an award for this program. Um, it's the top 1% of patient satisfaction in the entire country for this program, and it's run by nurses. I love it. It's advanced practice nurses um, become the, the single provider of healthcare. So our advanced practice nurses work with our neurologists, geriatricians, so that they have supervision where they have questions, but the advanced practice nurses really become the one point of care. So rather than a person with memory problems and dementia having to go see their primary care doctor, then the neurologist, their cardiologist, their psychiatrist, they get to the neurologist, uh, 
have an OBGYN, um, in that journey, you can imagine how complicated it is because we all navigate that life. Um, when a person has a diagnosis of dementia, there's nothing more important than focusing on what's really important, putting all the medical problems into a single perspective in the hands of a single caregiver so it's one-stop shopping. And that's what our nurse practitioners have done with this integrated memory care clinic for those who are seeking uh, who, who like this solution. We also are just launching uh, the Mild Cognitive Impairment Recovery Program. So we've been planning this over the last six months and we'll be doing a little bit more planning. But we were just awarded a very generous um, grant from the Cox Foundation here in Atlanta. And this has been a collaborative program that we're building with Georgia Tech. At the stage of mild cognitive impairment, when there's early stage memory loss, what we typically do is make a diagnosis. Um, there's not a single medication that's approved for mild cognitive impairment. You might try one or two, um, but we really don't have any that are approved. And we, because in this early stage, the symptoms are mild, um, what we do is typically recommend and improve your sleep hygiene, we uh, adopt a Mediterranean diet, exercise 150 minutes a week, Keep cognitively stimulated, socially engaged, um, think about safety issues, and we say, come back and see us in a year. That's not very acceptable for many of our patients. So what we do is we want to develop tools, and it's including a living laboratory where people can come to a day program and benefit from social, uh, physical, cognitive uh, activities. Um, and we want to develop technologies where we can actually measure whether people are effective uh, in a changing their lifestyle and whether these interventions are actually doing something that are useful. So this is a whole research and support program that we're going to be launching <coughs> next year and we're just uh, doing renovations now. Um, we are also in what I consider now the most progressive state in the country when it comes to Alzheimer's disease caregiving uh, diagnosis. Uh, thanks to our legislators, last year they uh, awarded four million dollars a year in the state budget for us to start something called the Georgia Memory Net. And this is uh, uh, basically this net is a network or a support net uh, as we envision it so that throughout the state there are clinics like the one we have at Emory and the Research Center where we can train people to make early accurate diagnosis as a first step. We can make sure the primary care physicians around the state are helping with screening for memory loss like you, we want to, we'll get that done today. And then most importantly, even in this era without an effective treatment, we want to make sure that people are coupled immediately with diagnosis with the support services they need. Uh, making sure they learn about foundations where help is available um, and providing people in those clinics where the diagnoses are made to get to make sure the families and care, uh, caregivers are directly linked with the support services available. You can see here on that list, we've launched five sites around um, the state just this past year, and we'll see how that program works, including Albany, Atlanta, Augusta, Columbus, and Lincoln. Next slide, please. Um, the caregiving partners uh, uh, that we have here include the Alzheimer's Association here in Georgia, has been terrific. Uh, Rosalind Carter lives here, when she's in Atlanta, here at the Carter Center. Uh, she has been passionate about caregiving and started the uh, Rosalind Carter, uh, Carter Institute for Caregiving as a partner in this journey as well, so that we can really provide professional expertise and get that linked into all the clinics. Next slide. Next slide. Um, generally, um, one of the largest studies that we've ever embarked upon is called the Emory Healthy Aging Study. And we launched this project four years ago with the realization that um, there's this 20 year period when Alzheimer's disease and related pathologies are beginning uh, before symptoms begin. And we're gonna need to develop biomarkers to identify people in these pre-symptomatic stages, uh, like the blood tests or other means uh, that, uh, like the memory tests we're showing you. Uh, and then we have to develop the tools to intervene to help people keep healthy. We still have a lot to learn about what are those risk factors. So I've shared a lot with you today I can tell you there's a lot more we don't know about risk factors and the, the genes that cause the disease. And there's a lot to learn, obviously, in terms of treatments ahead. And so this really gives us a platform to do a lot of studies with the Emory Healthy Aging Study. Um, it's open to anybody over the age of 18, anywhere in the United States. 
and it's all simple online. So that we can learn about risk factors um, from large numbers of people. Um, our goal with the Emory Healthy Aging Study is to recruit at least 100,000 people. Um, the more here in the Georgia area, the better, uh, because the more opportunities there are for those individuals then to come in. Uh, one of the things that we ask some of those people to come in for is to participate in what's called the Emory Healthy Brain Study. Um, those are people that are typically between the ages of 45 or 50 to 70. Uh, people that have normal memory, we're not talking about people that are impaired, um, so that we can learn about these preclinical stages and what keeps some people healthy um, and others who will go on to get the disease. Um, and what we do is we bring in several thousand people uh, into the Emory campus where they participate in several days of research, including brain scans, memory tests, cardiovascular tests, things we measure cardiovascular health, et cetera. Um, and so that's, that's really, that's underway now about three years. We have about 20,000 people that have signed up for that Emory Healthy Aging Study. We have over 700 people that have come in so far for this uh, Healthy Brain Study. Next slide, please. Uh, you can pass that, it just says what I already told you. Our recent, uh, our, our recent initiatives include a dramatic expansion of our clinical trials capacity. Uh, so the future that we envision now, again, is one that's aiming at prevention, and we have a lot to do in a short amount of time to get ahead of this. And, and from my point of view, there's so much we've learned about Alzheimer's disease, that we haven't begun to test many of the things that are really available today. Uh, research takes time, money, and most importantly, it takes individuals who want to participate as research subjects for us to work together as a team to figure out what's going to be effective. And now when we think about clinical trials, testing new medications, for example, to see what's going to be effective, we think about these stages of Alzheimer's disease that we talked about. We think about a new generation of clinical trials where the first time we really are testing prevention before symptoms begin. Um, we also have new ways to think about identifying people with mild cognitive impairment or the early stages of Alzheimer's disease and how we might take different strategies to slow the disease down and affect the progression. If we could arrest the disease at mild cognitive impairment stage, I think you would find that most people would have a fantastic quality of life. Um, you're gonna meet Brian LeBlanc later today who was an amazing person. Uh, Brian, it's been a great pleasure meeting. Uh, he is a courageous person who's affected by Alzheimer's disease. And as you'll see when he talks to you, um, he's the most inspiring person I've met in quite a while. And I think, uh, I hope his quality of life is as good as it appears from uh, participating in today. And then we also have work to do on the symptoms of the disease, um, some of the behavioral changes that he said. And those take a different, different type of strategy altogether. Um, I like to uh, conclude with some of the really exciting clinical and give you a picture of what we're seeing as researchers. Um, there have been a lot of failures over the last five years in medications to um, target amyloid, these amyloid plaques. In fact, it's been so frightening because of the failures. Um, these trials are very expensive, billions of dollars for an individual drug company, and they only get one or two shots on goals. Um, because there have been a series of failures over the last five years, we've seen the exiting of research by Pfizer um, and some other major drug companies. So I'd like to give people a positive reminder about why I'm optimistic. This is a one amyloid treatment, and what is done is an infusion of an antibody. Our own immune system is turned into a, 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 basically a, a way to get rid of the amyloid. The immune system targets the amyloid and clears it. And what you see here is a picture of four different individuals in these brain scans. The column on the left shows four brain scans. Um, all of them have a lot of the red and yellow amyloid, which we talked about earlier, which is a testing <coughs> showing that their brains are full of Alzheimer's pathology. The column on the right there is those, so, those same four individuals treated uh, with either placebo or increasing doses of the vaccine, the uh, medicine called Edutanumab. And what you can see is the person who received the placebo is up there on the top. And if you compare the left and the right top pictures, they look virtually identical. Over that year interval, there was not much change in the amyloid. 
but for those three other individuals treated with this uh, antibody, you can see that the amyloid was actually cleared out of the brain. That's pretty remarkable, isn't it? We are often asked, you know, can we slow this disease? Here we're actually reversing some of the pathology of the brain. We, of course, don't care what a picture of the brain looks like. What we really care about is how people are doing. Um, how is their quality of life? How is their memory? How is their functioning? And these bar graphs just show that those same people that had the amyloid cleared from their brain showed less progression of the disease over the year. This is one of the first times that I've seen very promising evidence that uh, one of these treatments can reverse the pathology or at least arrest it and may slow the disease process. So that medication is currently in clinical trials. Um, the medications also, um, you know, when we do research, I like to say that research is research because we don't know if the treatment is effective we don't know if it's safe. We know with those vaccine approaches like the amyloid antibody that I just showed you that there's gonna be some potential for uh, serious side effects. It's gonna be a low number, uh, but if you're one of five people out of 100 that get a side effect, it's pretty serious. And so we're, we have to learn about how these things are safe or not. I, I'm very excited about another research approach, which is completely out of the box and involves a local collaboration here in Georgia. Uh, this is a, uh, what we've done is come together with the, the young professor that you see there, Annabelle Singer, is a new faculty member at Georgia Tech. Uh, Annabelle just came last year from uh, her research training where she worked at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Boston which like Georgia Tech is one of the, really the two leading engineering schools in the country. Annabelle, while she was there, um, figured out that she had a non-invasive treatment for mice uh, with Alzheimer's disease. <laughs> and so she's been studying mice and she learned that if she showed mice, if she flashed lights at a certain frequency, like a strobe light, that the brain activity would adopt the frequency of the light flicker. And what happened was that brain activity would then clear out the amyloid that was built up in the brain of the mice. It was really amazing, right? I mean, that's like science fiction. We're going to turn the lights off and on and all. Right? What's going to happen? Well, that was a, it was a breakthrough, and she got she had this very very uh, high impact paper. And so what we're doing is, um, since she moved here to Atlanta, we now are building doing the first in human research study. So the company is formed called Cognito. They have the device that I've had on and the, the lights flicker. Um, and we're gonna do a test where we actually have people exposed to the light. And then we're gonna do this new retinal amyloid test where we can actually see if the amyloid is getting cleared out. Uh, we're also doing some other measures as well. So it's a good example of out of the box research and that we're just trying to really open up uh, new approaches, including non-invasive ones, and bring the best minds from all over together to work together. I view a huge opportunity for repurposing medications which are already out there. Um, I mentioned earlier that we're learning that inflammation plays a big role in why this disease progresses. Um, we're learning that some medications which are already out there, um, including a medication called Stratera, if you can advance this slide, um, increases the level of a brain chemical uh, that was used worldwide for treating children and adults with attention deficit disorder. Uh, this medication has the means, we think now, to reduce brain inflammation. And we just finished a clinical trial in people with mild uh, memory loss to see if we can actually reduce the amount of inflammation. And so those results we're expecting shortly. And then we were, finally, we're in a new era of prevention, as I mentioned. Uh, we're, you know, all of our research centers across this country work together. One of the studies that we're doing, which we're very excited about, is the first effort to prevent the disease. So we're testing these new amyloid vaccines that I showed you had great promise in people uh, who have normal memory, who don't have Alzheimer's disease, uh, but who have the preclinical signs from the test scans we were trying to do. So in the years ahead, we're gonna, um, I look forward to the day where we can actually prevent this disease and make it the way to end. So I wanna thank all of you for attending. Um, you are generously supported, including by all of you, whether you know it or not, your tax dollars are hard at work here in Atlanta. Uh, we have generous recipients of money from the National Institutes of Health, um, making sure your, um, your, uh, your congressmen and senators, uh, your representatives are, are aware of how much you're concerned about Alzheimer's disease is important. Um, it's absolutely amazing. Alzheimer's disease research funding has increased dramatically. 
Um, it's now over $2.4 billion a year. That's tripled in the last five years, which is, is staggering. And it's really important because we have so many things we can test and we're just short of time and money. So it's clearly headed in the right direction. And you can see there's private foundations and industry that are all partners as well. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. today than it was several generations ago? Yes. And if so, why? Okay, thank you. There you are. <laughs> um, the disease is more prevalent. Um, in fact, our neighbors here at the Centers for Disease Control do the annual mortality rate statistic for the country. And the last time that I saw it, um, the rate for Alzheimer's disease had gone up about 30% over that 10-year period, um, while heart disease, cancer, and stroke had all gone down. Um, so there, I think there are two major reasons why um, the prevalence rates are going up. Uh, one is because the most, the biggest driver is people are living longer. As I mentioned, age is the biggest risk factor, and the number of people living to the past 65 and 85 continues to decline uh, as the baby boomers are becoming uh, of age and growing older. Um, again, nearly one out of every two of them will have Alzheimer's disease, and so that's driving it. Um, we think factors like here in the southeast, um, the same risk factors for stroke apply to Alzheimer's disease, hypertension, fried foods, things like that, maybe driving some local incidences as well. And then surviving other health conditions like cancer and stroke means that people are you know, now more susceptible to Alzheimer's disease. Good morning. Um, I think I heard you say that statins lowers the risk of Alzheimer's disease. Is that correct? If I said that, I probably should have been a little bit more precise because it's a really good question and a really important question. Um, what I should say, if I didn't, is that we know statins lower cholesterol levels and can lower the risk of heart disease as a result of lowering cholesterol. 
Um, we have not seen a study done to see if taking a statin will lower Alzheimer's disease directly. So that study really needs to be done before we can conclude that statin should be used to help reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease. Before that, though, there are clues. So there are epidemiologic studies where we can look at large studies where people have taken statin uh, just because of general health reasons. And then we look at the risk of Alzheimer's disease in those who take the statin versus those who don't. And then there have been many studies showing that the, the risk is lower for those who take statin. Uh, but it's the necessary clinical trial to test people you know, prospectively in a double-blind manner is sort of the gold standard that the uh, Food and Drug Administration in this country and worldwide requires for us to begin recommending statin be used to, as a treatment for reducing risk of Alzheimer's. Is that clear? Related, but I run into a lot of children, um, parents with children with ADD. Is there any research or correlation between attention deficit children who become adults? Or is, I mean, is this an out of box question? Yeah, that is out of the box question. It's it sort of past our minds as well from time to time. I haven't seen any good studies to help us answer that. Uh, is there any research? globally that you uh, are looking at uh, institutions that are doing global research like um, you would be recommending you look at that in Europe or wherever it is? It's a great question. Um, what I'm really proud of is that our research efforts are worldwide and we have global partners. Uh, so we've had studies for many years and we have very active studies now with the UK.
rescue care into your home. So we have um, trained CNAs trained in Alzheimer's dementia care, and we can bring them into your home to give the primary caregiver um, most most of the respite. Great, great. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Bob Goldberg. How is everyone today? Hi. I'm an elder law attorney, and elder law is hard to explain. Mm -hmm. And also, I went to West Point where I graduated in 1982, and the first thing I was told was, keep your sense of humor and don't take it personally, and you can make it through this place. <laughs> so, so, so I'm gonna say the same thing to you, and in that spirit, I usually tell people to turn off their phones, but I want you to pick up your phone, and I want you to go to Safari, or, and I want you to Google Beatles Help Lyrics. Can everyone do that for me? Google Beetle Help Lyrics. And oh, I, will, I will help you. And then there, you'll get uh, the Beatles Help Lyrics, Genius Lyrics. I want you to click on that. And now no one can tell me you don't know the words, okay? And we're all gonna sing together, believe it or not. And I am watching you, even though there's a lot of glare here. I'm giving you time. Beatles help lyrics. If I could sing, I'd be out singing. I wouldn't be here. So why are we going to sing this? Well, I, I had an epiphany one day. I couldn't explain what elder law was, and I realized John Lennon had done it for me, especially about the part about where your independence seems to vanish in the haze. So I think this is very, very appropriate. I've never sang sitting down before, but I'm going to. Here. I'll, I will sing standing up so I can get it from my diaphragm. If you want to stand up with me, you can too. So I'll get us in tune. Mm. You ready? Help, I need somebody. Help, not just anybody. Help, you know, I need someone. Help. When I was younger, so much younger than today, I never needed anybody's help in any way. Now those days are gone, I'm not so self-assured. Now I find I changed my mind and opened up the doors. Help me if you can, I'm feeling down. And I do appreciate you being proud. Help me get my feet back on the ground. Won't you please, please help me? Here's the important part. And now my life has changed in oh so many ways. My independence seems to vanish in the haze. But every now and then I feel so insecure. I know that I just need you like I've never done before. Help me if you can, I'm feeling down. And I do appreciate you being round. Help me get my feet back on the ground. Won't you please, please help me, help me, ooh, ooh. what we're here to do is just to answer questions for you. So be, be brave and ask questions. So what do you do when Here. 
Did you consider having somebody in your home, like a home health aide? No, because that would not have um, that would not have solved my problem, which was he was up wandering all night, so he kept me up wandering and trying to figure out where he was. Okay. So we never got any rest, and so not having rest does not make you your best self in this environment. Thank you very much for telling the story. So talk a little bit about, about what you guys do and how you, how you work in the community. Um, and we can provide help 24 seven, and in some cases we do. Um, most commonly we'll come in two, three days a week for eight to 12 hours a day to give a break, but we certainly can be there 24 seven. I don't know if that would help in that particular situation because still if you're sharing the same room and they're up, then obviously you would not be getting rest. And how do you deal with family dynamics? Because I know from, from personal experience, it would take somebody really, really super special to that I would allow into my home to take care of my loved ones. So how do you how do you dance that dance? Right, well, we have about 100 CNAs um, and employed with our, just our particular agency. And so we kind of really hard in the initial assessment to, to kind of gather the personality that they're looking for and how the dynamics of the family, so we would know who to bring in. But we don't always get it right the first time. And if it's not a good match, then we we bring someone else. And once we get a good match, we try to always bring that same person back in. Because they develop a relationship with the family, for sure. Right. How many people in the room have home health aides take care of loved ones? Dr. Parker, talk to us. Well, I have a question. Actually, it's, it's something I'd like to direct to the elder care attorney. Yeah, I'm also a caregiver, but I also have in-home help. Would you kindly tell the audience the kinds of documents they need and why they need them and when? Um, people are always talking about, oh, we've got to do estate planning, we have to do this, we have to do that. Would you please tell them about the different documents they must have? Sure, thank you. I think if I say the two words, estate planning, well, what does everyone think I'm talking about? If I say estate planning, what am I talking about? My insurance, my will, and, and a will does what? It, it distributes your property when you die. But what, but what we're talking about here is you know, an, an, an essential component of my definition of estate planning, which is I want to take care of me, my spouse, and my family if, if I become disabled. So. My advice is everyone over 18 years of age needs to have several essential documents. The, the, the first thing is a health care advance directive. Where, where does this come from? Well, well, we have to go all the way back to the 70s with Karen Quinlan. Does anyone remember Karen Quinlan? She, she was a young woman and she mixed quaaludes and alcohol and went into a coma. 
and that's when we first had started having this discussion about advanced directives. The, uh, the next case had to do with a woman named Nancy Cruzan, and then everyone probably remembers the Terry Schiavo case. Uh, well, in, in the Nancy Cruzan case, the, the United States Supreme Court decided that we have a right to privacy found in the 14th Amendment, which included our right to refuse medical treatment. But it's very important we provide evidence. I'm an attorney, I love evidence, and, and the beauty of it is, is we need to create this evidence when we're competent. So you know, we need to communicate these difficult things, and we need to sign a healthcare advance directive to provide clear and convincing evidence, first of all, about who's gonna make decisions for us if we're not able to do so. That, that's the healthcare power of attorney. We want to sign a HIPAA release so that our families can have meaningful conversations with our physicians and other healthcare providers because our healthcare information is private to us and we have to sign a release. Third, we have to sign a living will which gives our instructions at end of life. And I've been doing this for, for 19 years. I, I got into this, I went to a continuing legal education 19 years ago, our aging parents, what every attorney needs to know, and, and I've been dealing with a lot of caregivers taking care of loved ones with Alzheimer's, and I, I phrase my living will in the following terms. I'm unable to communicate, consider whether I'm going to be able to experience a meaningful life, and make your decisions based upon that. One other thing that I have started adding to my healthcare advance directives is, is a dementia advance directive. What, what I have found is that the living will covers artificial nutrition and hydration. Again, I want you to think about the very difficult decision. Do I want to be hand fed if I have late stage the dementia? And I like to, for people to have that conversation. So at base level, healthcare advance directives. Next, you have to have a durable power of attorney for financial affairs. Sounds like a simple document, but I see a lot of people making mistakes. And this is where a person named the principal gives authority to a person called the agent who has a fiduciary responsibility, a duty of the highest order to use the principal's fi finances, their, their, their money, for them, you know, just because you're married to someone, you, you don't have decision-making authority. And, and we do those things, we sign a healthcare advance directive and a financial power of attorney so that we can avoid guardianship and conservatorship. So you know, baseline, that's what you have to do. Can you elaborate a little bit on veterans and what special, what special needs they may have and what paperwork they have to do? Yeah. And, I want to go back to the first question that was asked about the family caregiver and, and what Sonia touched on. And I, I, I started out in elder law and people were all about the Medicaid. I want to save the money, I want to save the money. And what I realized was that there's three goals in an elder law case. Get, take care of the sick person, right? We're moral human beings. We have to take care of the person whose independence is vanishing in the AIDS. You know, Secondly, we have to take care of the caregiver, and I think that's what I was hearing, is that you know, caregiving can make you sick. It can consume you like the burning bush. And then, and then everyone is afraid to spend their, their money, right? So the third goal is, can I find a way to pay for care, including respite care? And you know, you, people work hard their whole lives. It, it's okay to spend your loved one's money on care, because it's going to give them the care they need and it's going to give the caregiver respite. And there are some public benefits available, you know, one of them being veterans benefits. Right. Now, there's several kinds of veterans benefits. One is called compensation for a service-connected disability. That, that's if you get hurt in the service. So I, I, would, I was in the Army, as I said, I graduated from West Point. I was a helicopter pilot. I got adult onset asthma while I was in the service stationed in Savannah. I have a 10% disability rating. 
I get compensation. I get a check every month, and I get a little higher um, consideration on the VA healthcare system. But but there's another VA benefit called pension. Actually, it's called improved pension. You might know it by the term aid in attendance, but it's really pension with aid in attendance, and that's a needs-based benefit. If you have net worth below the Medicaid limit, and, and the law is changing on October 18th, and I will say that again, the law is changing in about two weeks. If you have net worth below the Medicaid limit, which is $123,600, and you're spending your money on care, you can qualify for pension. So if you're spending your money on care in the home, you're paying someone from senior helpers to come in, or you're in an assisted living, or even if you're a nursing home and you're needy, you will qualify for pension, which can be a big difference maker. We talked about the, uh, the one before, we talked about <laughs> caregiver burnout, basically, and caregivers getting sick. So I mean, do you want to address how you all sort of step in and, and assist with, with that? This was about well, it's been 11 years ago. Um, so my mother, being his primary caregiver, um, finally just kind of threw her hands up and said, "I need help." So she sold her home and moved in with us, which was great. We had plenty of room for her to move in, and um, and then within the year, we all realized we were all really tired too, <laughs> even though there were now three adults, um, two of us having having jobs. So. We sort of juggled it, and, and mom had a break, and we had a break, but it, it was still, it was still a lot. And that that went on just for a year. We were at the very last stages, um, where we were helping him to, we're feeding him and that sort of thing. So uh, yes, caregiver burnout is definitely a real thing, even if you can rotate among family members. So I can only imagine someone who's completely alone, um, doing this. And um, and again, that's where we can come in, and we do accept the VA benefits that that you were just uh, talking about, Robert, so. I do have to say that senior helpers, uh, again, from personal experience, our request was, was pretty specific, and this was back in New York. We asked for a female caregiver who spoke Italian and who could deal with five daughters who all thought we needed more than the other one did. Um, I, of course, being the most brilliant of them all. Um, and two senior helpers credit, they, they found a person, oh, and, and yes, and was able to deal with my mom, and that in and of itself was a major challenge. So um, I'm gonna speak on behalf of, of you guys and say I don't, I don't think any, any request is too big of a request. Remember that when you call Sonia. Um, any questions from the audience? I have a question for you. Sure. Um, I have a question for you, Sonia. I'm a caregiver of my mom. I'm a full time um, employee at the state. I'm an only child. And I want to know in other states, there are caregiver laws where, where you work and you take care of your parent or someone with Alzheimer's that you're able to stop working and care for your parents, have you heard of anyone that in Georgia have considered that? I don't know if I asked the right question. You, want to know if you, can get it. you mean where the state pays? No, no, no. Well, let me, let me start over. Um, where you have to stop working and you have to kind of completely carry it upon your parents. Um, is there a law that will able, be able for you to do that? Or have anyone thought about that? Because I know places, um, maybe Alabama, if you're taking care of your parent or you're able to, can you work half an hour or do something like that to care for your parent with Alzheimer's? Besides family medical, besides family As part of, you know, med, other states have waiver programs right. where, where, where through, through Medicaid, you know, they, they will pay a family caregiver. Caregiver, as far as I know, we don't have that. One, one thing in VA planning you can do, remember I said you have to be paying the income for care? Right. So a, a parent can have a family caregiver agreement with a child and, and pay the child for care. 
in order to help qualify for the VA benefit. But, but as far as I know, you know, Georgia doesn't have dollars available to pay caregivers. Now, we, we do have a program called Home and Community Based Services, which is a Medicaid waiver program. Specifically, it's called CCSP, Community Care Service Providers. And you can call the, the, the AAA, the, the Atlanta Area, Area Agency on Aging, and tell them you know, you're interested in applying for CCSP, the Community Care Service Provider Program, and that will give you some respite, you know, help to pay for someone like senior helpers to come into the home with Medicaid paying for it. The, the, the other thing I would, you know, and, and I'm going back to the three essential questions of elder law, which are, where am I going, where is my loved one going to live, who's going to take care of them, and how am I going to pay for it, and you, you got to put together this caregiving puzzle and in, in, inquire into adult day programs, you know, both private adult day programs, a lot of churches have ministries with adult day programs, a lot of times these adult day programs will be paid for by Medicaid. They, they might even have transportation to and from the adult day program. So it's like kid daycare, but adult daycare. Okay, thank you. And then I'll follow up on that. They, they do have those. Um, but for instance, my, my father, we took him to a church uh, daycare, adult daycare one time. <laughs> and then they said he's just too far advanced to stay. So I think we were looking for the earlier to middle stages. Or need um, assistance, call our call the AFA's National Telephone Helpline, and we can refer you to local agencies here in the in the Atlanta area. Um, hi, my name is Fran, and uh, two things. One, um, my mother passed away two years ago. Uh, Alzheimer's. Um, Alzheimer's really is um, dementia, and um, while she was in the hospital in the ICU, uh, Facebook popped up for the Emory Healthy Aging on my page, and I signed up, and I'm in the brain study, and it is not that bad. It's actually a life bomb. So please sign up. It's really cool. And it's something to do. Um, two, speaking of my mother, who is from rural Georgia, not Atlanta, and um, two folks, so it's myself and my older brother. So what do you do when siblings don't agree on care? And because and I wanted her to come here, he wanted her to stay there. And so ultimately she stayed, but there's not a lot of resources there. And how are we working with these rural areas to get resources to them? I, I, I will say that you know, through, through the federal government, there's funding provided through the Older Americans Act for the Atlanta, the AAAs, the Area Agencies on Aging. You know, we're, we're sitting here in Atlanta, it's the Atlanta Area Agency on Aging, but every, every county is divided into this you know, bureaucracy where they're gonna have a AAA. So, so there's probably more resources than you knew. Uh, you know, for, for example, senior centers get their funding through the AAA. So you can, you can Google, you know, in, in your account, like I, I know on the, uh, in Coweta County has the Three Rivers Area Agency on Aging. So th th there are these d divisions there. Now, if you, in, in your situation where you and your brother were not seeing eye to eye on her care, you know, every, every county in Georgia has a probate court. And you, you don't want to have to do this. I try and avoid this like the plague. But if you're truly not seeing it eye to eye, you, you have to look at what's the best interest of a person who can't make decisions for themselves. And if you might have to go to probate court and get a guardianship to put one person in charge to be the guardian over a ward to, to bring her from Louisville to Atlanta where there are gonna be more resources in a major city. Yeah, we didn't have anyone who wanted to ruin the family relations. To Wait, I, I, yeah. I, I agree with you, but, as a, hey, but you know, what, what, what are we looking at? The, the, the best interests of the, the ward, and that has to be our, our load star. Yeah, and, and I guess, too, just to piggyback, um, is yeah. I feel like, and maybe I'm the only one, there needs to be more marketing, if for a better term, of displacing that shame of the um, diagnosis because in small town areas it's like we 
don't want anybody to know mom's having problems. And so that's some good to know. Okay, well, so yeah. So just getting there. And I know you guys might not have that answer, but just getting out there and saying, hey, there's things that can be done. Don't hide from the It's hard also when you when you have a family dynamic because as as Bob said, you you have to almost stop yourself because you think you know what's best. And sometimes you have to turn it over to the professionals. Um, and it's not about you or your siblings, it's about your mom or your dad or whoever's affected by, by, by this disease. And that's, that's that really difficult balance. I know for us, when I told my sisters we were contacting senior helpers, I was like, you know, we'll stop talking to you for a while. It's okay, we <laughs> dealt with it. One wanted dad to go to assisted living, the other said, no, dad is fine at home. So the compromise was, okay, he can stay at home and we'll bring senior helpers in a couple of days a week. So. And I, I want to share something on the, the stigmatization, <laughs> which I, I, I learned of one of these things probably 15 years ago from Dr. Toon. And, and he, he described Alzheimer's as organ failure of the brain. And if you accept it as organ failure of the brain, what, what is there to be stigmatized about? You, are you stigmatized by organ failure of the heart or organ failure of the lungs? You know, it, it's not going crazy, it's organ failure of the brain. And you just have to read it, re it, educate. And that's the key, is the education. Uh, what kind of fees can we expect when we hire another lawyer? I'll give you the lawyer answer and it, it, it depends. I, I, will, I will tell you that what I charge and many elder lawyers will charge is a, is a flat fee approximately equal to one, one to one and a half months of nursing home care. Right, that, and, 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 a, and a flat fee will cover all the planning that we need to do, advanced directives, asset protection planning, applying for veterans benefits, applying for Medicaid, doing you know, a, a will or a trust on so, so The average cost of nursing home care in Georgia went up a lot this year. It went from $6,100 to about $6,700. What, what is the, uh, we get that in dollars in terms of um, one and a half percent? I, I, I don't charge a percentage of assets. What, what do nursing homes charge? So, somewhere between you know sixty-seven hundred dollars and twelve thousand dollars, just depending upon the composition of the family, the composition of the assets, you know what we have to do. Which include uh, wills, everything else. Yes. Yes. It, in, in, in a crisis Medicaid case. Mom. For those people who don't have that amount of money, the Atlanta Legal Aid does provide services to people who can't afford it. And that's the Atlanta Legal Aid. They do have special legal programs, as does the Georgia Heirs Property Law Center. And keep in mind that every single situation is different. You know, and we always say when you've met one person who has Alzheimer's disease, you've met one person who has Alzheimer's disease. And the same goes for families. Family dynamics are different, family financials are different. So I, I would venture to say it's impossible for Bob to be like, well, your fee, sir, will be. It's pretty hard. Hi, um, I just wanted to share a little bit of my story and then my question at the end. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, or fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you want to look at it, I had parents who both had um, it started back in about 1998, me driving from Atlanta to South Georgia every week trying to help them because they were eventually moving in my home in 2001. And my mother just died in 2016. So, you know, I'm listening and I come to these forums because, you know, one, I want to be educated and informed. I participated in memory, um, those kind of things to try to get the best information and of course, I have a concern about me getting all time as the two parents have. Um, and the whole process 
is very personal and extensive. Uh, I know for us, particularly being middle income, it is horrendous. Like several programs you mentioned, they are somewhat income based. Um, and so what is the United States doing on a global level to educate? And is anyone looking at when both parents have it and how that impacts um, the lives of the children and the generation and the gene? Because the journey got easier as time went on, but it was a struggle. And it, it impacted me. I ended up leaving the workforce and retiring early because it just got to be a lot. But because I'm resourceful, you know, that helped a lot. So my role now is to educate and I work with other families who are going through the struggle because sometimes it's, you know, deciding he needs he or she needs to leave home and now go to a different facility or they become violent or just a whole, you know, gamut of issues. So as you know, and I know you can only speak so much, but as a country, what are we really doing to educate people? And what are we really doing to provide the resources and services? I know somebody said earlier about states helping. California does have a program that they pay um, the caregiver who has to leave the workforce. Georgia does not. So, because to me, that's the challenge is we keep looking at the state to state and it's a global issue, but it impacts the United States more than even some um, undeveloped countries. So what are we doing? My, my, my answer would be that we're, we're not doing enough, and, and I believe it's a political issue. And you look at Medicare, and you know what, what is Medicare? He health insurance for people over the age of 65. It's health insurance for people who become disabled. Medicare also covers end-stage renal disease for people of any age. So I, I would say Medicare is discriminatory, right? It's covering end-stage renal failure for people of any age, but Medicare is, is not covering custodial care, which is what people with Alzheimer's need. what we can do while it is a global issue what we need to do on a on a state by state basis is is have days like today where you're able to get the information and, and get the resources that you need um, and at least start the discussion and you know be connected with folks like senior Pelfrey, be connected with the folks at emory who you know from everything i, I learned from from um, our partnership with emory you're, you're in a pretty special state because you've got a university like the, the fine folks at Emory who are really trying to advance understanding and knowledge and awareness of this. So um, while it is a global issue, I think on a state-by-state on -state basis, the more you can get educated, the better. Um, to the panel, hello, my name is David. I am a caregiver for my mother and she's in mid-stage of Alzheimer's at this point. Um, my question is more policy and legal as well. Um, I brought her here from Michigan. She had very few assets. And we, and I had to, as a result, as a real good powerful attorney for finance, I had to sell her home. Now I'm trying to follow the letter of the law and act with that responsibility. Now, one of the things, two things I've run into. Number one, the first thing that I deal with is trying to get an understanding of the Medicare or the, what I call, or what they call the Medicaid spend down. Because at some point, she's, I'm the only child, and I have a wife and a daughter. And at some point, my mother is going to reach the stage where what we're able to provide her is going to be insufficient. So, for the benefit of everybody here, we'd like to have an understanding of what is meant by the Medicaid spend down, how does it work? And I think the second question I have for you would be a little bit more offline. So, thank you. All right, so 
we, we know that Medicare doesn't cover custodial care. So we have to turn to Medicaid. Most people turn to Medicaid. You can either private pay for custodial care. Some people have long-term care insurance, but M Medicaid is the payer of last resort to pay for nursing home care or that CCSP program. And, and I like to look at the word Medicaid. What's it stand for? Medical aid. And aid is needs-based. And, and, and your mother is a single person. And for 19 years, the single person resource limit in Georgia has been $2,000 in countable resources. So, so when you, her, her home in Michigan actually was not exempt or non-countable. Had, had it been in Georgia, it would have been non-countable, but there's no, no reason to have a home. So, so you sell this home, you convert a non-countable resource into a countable resource. So now you have well, more than two thousand dollars. Did everyone agree with me? Sp spend down is the idea that your mother's not going to be eligible for Medicaid to pay for her skilled nursing services or waiver program until she spends below two thousand dollars in countable resources. But but you know, the thing is, if you spend all your money, th th there's nothing left. So. Under the law, and I don't like considering this as a loophole, you know, there are Medicaid planning strategies. And, and, and if you want to learn more about this, if you go to the Rosalind Carter Institute and you click on education up on the top, Rosalind Carter Institute Education 2017 webinars, I, I, I talk about this for an hour, but rather than spending down that there are certain exempt transfers that can be made. You know, transfers that do not cause a penalty period. There are ways to convert countable resources into non-countable resources. Um, in, in the home, if you're still taking care of in the home, back to these family caregivers, you, you can have a family caregiver agreement where mom can pay any family member for care, well, she's not giving away the money, she's spending it on care. Then the, the, the last strategy is actually quite complicated, but the, the law prohibits giving money away. It penalizes giving money away, but you, you can make a loan. You know, what's the difference between a gift and a loan? You, you have to do what if you sign a promissory note? You gotta pay it back. Right, so you, so, even in a crisis Medicaid case, in a single person case, you, you can protect about half of the resources. So, you know, I, I, like I said, I could talk about it for an hour, but you know, rather than spending down, it, it, it's a good idea to engage in Medicaid asset protection strategies, that then you'd have some of your loved one's money left over to pay for things that Medicaid doesn't pay for. But Medicaid is your base level care. So if you spend down, there's no, none of their money is going to be left. If you engage in Medicaid asset protection planning, you, you have your loved one's money to use to pay for sitters. You, you, you could pay for a private room. You could pay for dental care or hearing aids, anything Medicaid doesn't pay for. So does that, that make sense? And you have a second question. as well as the three, uh, three to five other exhibitors, please make sure that we can take a break, which will be um, after these two questions. You visit those tables and you can talk to these folks directly. Hi, my name is Cheryl and, and um, I provide some care for my aunt. She's actually currently in a skilled nursing facility as we discussed outside. Um, my primary question, without going into a whole bunch of detail, is what do you do if your loved one started the process of securing the documentation that they need, you know, doing the when you will and all of that, but they never completed that process. So you don't have durable power of attorney, whether medical or um, financial, yes. What kind of recourse do you have? What should you do when they're like, she's about stage six um, in her Alzheimer's journey? 
I would assume that she's, if she's in a skilled nursing facility that she doesn't have mental capacity to understand what she's doing. Sure. All right, so the, the, the law provides a mechanism where a person is unable to make significant responsible decisions about their health or safety and, or they're unable to make or communicate significant responsible decisions about their finances. So on the healthcare advance directive side, the, the law does provide a hierarchy of family members who can make decisions, but you might not know what the person's wishes are. You could go to probate court and get a guardianship over her person and have the court appoint the guardian, and that would be the one person to stop the family squabbling that we discussed. The finances is a little bit harder because you know unless someone has signed a durable power of financial attorney for financial affairs, then you know insurance companies aren't going to talk to you. You know people, the IRA custodian is not going to talk to you. That then you're going to be forced to go to probate court and have a conservator appointed. You know, people call it a conservatorship. I, I went to an advanced elder law seminar once, and I realized I did pronouncing it wrong because a conservator is appointed to conserve the property of the ward. So, so you go to probate court in the county where the proposed ward, where, where your aunt is living. Okay, and I will just add, she did prior to that because of a prior illness um, decades ago, uh, put me on her checking account so that handling bills has not been a problem. And early on, I was able to, we, we had her in our home. Right. Um, we had to put her in nursing care because she began to be a fall risk and we could not kept her, we could not lift her. Um, so what I'm trying to say is paying bills has not been an issue. And initially getting her to give authorization for me to handle her affairs initially was not an issue. But now that is getting to be an issue. Right, right. That's so, why so, right. so you, you were a joint owner, you could do things then, but now you're seeing problems now. You know, conservatorship in in the, the county probate court where, where she's domiciled, you know, where the nursing home is. Thank you. I want to know if any of you on the foundation has heard of CEBRA, C E B R A. It's a fairly new, it's not a treatment, it's done prescription. And I'm wondering if anybody in the room has, it's C-E-B-R-I-A. So it's a capsule. People are not medical professionals, so we're, we're not. Pardon? Able, the, the folks on the panel are not medical professionals, so we're not able to answer that question. Okay, another one. Uh, how do we get into the clinic that we have a chest? Can you Somebody in the room want to, there you go. Come around and see Dr. Parker. <laughs> okay, last question. My name is Carol Jacobs. Um, I was a caregiver for five years. My mom passed from a train, I call it transition, in 2015. Um, of course, we can say it was a long journey. But one of the, my biggest thing was I wanted to talk about was long-term care. One of the things that I found that was very important, I had long-term care, was I'm talking to other caregivers. I'd like them to elaborate a little bit on that and the importance, especially for baby boomers, if you don't have it, you need to get it. Because expenses are going, are skyrocketing. I pay $5,500 a month for my mother's care, plus more. So everyone doesn't have $5,500 a month. So you need supplements. So long-term care insurance. Long-term care insurance. Yeah, I, I counsel people. You know, I, I do regular estate planning also. And, and people will check the box. I'm afraid of losing everything to the, the nursing home. And if, if they're healthy enough, if they're insurable, and if they can afford the, the premium, I will advise people to get long-term care insurance. Now, I, I'm not an insurance agent. I don't get you know kickbacks from it. I, I just see you know my clients who have long-term care insurance have more options. And I, I look at a lot of policies, and what I'm seeing is, Premiums may be $3,600 to $4,400 a year. And the, the cost of care is $5,500 and upwards 
a month. So yeah, you do, 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 yeah, do, 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 do the math. You know, it, 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 it's insurance, you know, uh, and we have automobile insurance, we have homeowners insurance, you know, a lot of us have life insurance. And you, know, you, you heard the statistics, how many people are going to get this d disease. And you know, even if you do not get Alzheimer's disease, you, you could get another chronic condition or several of them that's going to affect your memory or your mobility where you'll make a claim someday. So I, I think, I agree with you, it's a good thing to have. And I have one other question. Uh, senior health nurse. Um, I had someone come to my home first and I was astonished about the cost. And I, I've gone to a lot of forums and listened and I think that we do a disservice because sometimes we don't really expand on the cost of care, of how much it would a range of how much it would cost for someone to come into your, a CNA to come into the house for the afternoon or for just a short time in the morning, or you may have to work, so you need someone for eight hours. Can you give a range of costs, even though you can't be specific, but just a range? Right, it is mostly private pay we do, um, except the long-term care insurance. So long-term care insurance, in addition to covering you know, your, your assisted living, could pay for someone just to come into your home as well, so then it wouldn't be out of pocket. Um, but you're asking what the rate is? It's somewhere between 18 and $20 an hour. But we do accept VA benefits, which will help pay for that, Medicaid, and again, long-term care insurance. So as I said, both Sonia and Bob have tables, exhibit tables outside. Please visit them. We're going to take a 15-minute break. Lunch is outside. Please grab your lunch, visit the exhibit tables, uh, and then come back on in. Please give Sonia and Bob a round of applause.